On behalf of the UCLA uh, Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, I'd like to welcome you to the 1939 Society Program and Holocaust Studies, highlighting the work of Professor Wendy Lauer, uh, Claremont McKenna College, who has joined us today to discuss her most recent book, The Ravine, A Family, A Photograph, and A Holocaust Massacre Revealed. Uh, the book is available through HarperCollins and wherever books are sold. I'd like to also know that this event is co-sponsored with a year-long team talk cl cluster course called Political Violence in the Modern World, in which a class of 200 first-year students focus on three case studies involving political violence and or genocide, uh, one of which is, of course, the Holocaust. Uh, a number of students are joining us today in this webinar format and will help uh, facilitate the discussion with Professor Lauer. Uh, please note that this event is being re recorded and will be available for streaming on the Levy Center webpage, uh, which we will link to in the chat box. Um, please do allow a week or so for the video to be uploaded. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to include at any point, uh, feel free to include any questions at any point in the presentation or the discussion. So if something comes up during the presentation and you don't want to forget it, uh, feel free to enter it into the, the, the Q&A. Uh, and lastly, we want to thank everyone for staying socially distanced, uh, yet again, I guess, uh, and intellectually engaged by joining us for these virtual uh, events. So uh, just a quick biography on Professor Lauer. Uh, she is the John K. Roth Professor of History and the director of the McGrublian Center for Human Rights at Claremont McKenna College. Lauer chairs the academic committee of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and served as acting director of the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mendel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at USH uh, m and um, from 2016 uh, to 2018. Uh, she is author of many wonderful books, which I encourage everyone to get out and buy a copy of uh, and read, uh, which include Nazi Empire Building and the Holocaust in Ukraine from 2005, uh, an edited volume of a diary, a diary of Samuel uh, Goldfard and the Holocaust in Galicia from 2011, uh, a co-edited volume with Ray Brandon called The Shoah in Ukraine, History, Testimony, and Memorialization from 2008, um, and her um, uh, prior book, uh, Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields from 2013, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Uh, her most recent book is, again, The Ravine, uh, which, which appeared in 2021 uh, and will be the subject of today's discussion. So without further ado, I want to turn it over uh, to Professor Lauer and again, thank her for joining us uh, for this discussion and presentation. Thank you, Jared, for that lovely introduction and hello also to um, other colleagues at UCLA, uh, Michael Rothberg, um, and thank you to the Levy Center and Chelsea White and David Wu and everyone for getting this program, helping me put this program together. It's really great to join you today. Uh, of course, the plan was to be in person, um, so I appreciate that we all were able to kind of pivot to this format, and hopefully this is not going to be forever this semester, um, and we'll all be in the classroom soon. Um, I know there are some freshmen here attending, and um, and that's exciting too. I'm um, really encouraged if you're a freshman and you've enrolled in a course like this, then uh, that gives me a lot of hope. Um, I wanted to mention that my presentation today is gonna focus on a very disturbing photograph. Um, and I realize that many of you have not seen this before. I've been working on it since 2009. Um, it still is very upsetting to me, but um, doesn't have the kind of, um, it doesn't uh, uh, paralyze me in the same way that it used to. So um, I just wanted to mention that before I put the photo up on the screen in a moment. <clears throat> now, uh, we have all seen how one photograph of suffering um, of, or violence can move audiences and propel humanitarian action and social justice. And we, are, uh, we live in a world of iconic imagery of atrocities, a naked girl fleeing a napalm attack in Vietnam, a little Syrian boy named Alan Kurdi, whose corpse washed up on the Turkish beach in that little red t-shirt, the Honduran girl crying while her mother is searched at the US-Mexican border. And of course, in the history of the Holocaust, we have hundreds of thousands of images, millions actually, it's one of the most photographed genocides and also uh, the Second World War, one of the most photographed wars on record. Um, some of these images, like the one of the Holocaust victim in Ukraine, it's called The Last Jew in Vinitsa, so I'm gonna show it to you in a moment, it shows a man kneeling over a pit with a gun to his head. And when you think about other um, uh, types of, of images that we think of, the, like the railway lines leading to Auschwitz-Birkenau or, or the little boy in the Warsaw Ghetto with his hands raised, these become part of our collective memory of particular historical disasters 
Yet they are widely circulated and displayed with little information about the circumstances or persons pictured in them, and usually even less about the photographer. So as an historian of the Holocaust and someone, as Jared mentioned, who spent um, quite a bit of time working at the Holocaust Museum, even through graduate school and being influenced by the way that history is presented in that, in that visual form, highly visual and artifactual form. I was especially, especially concerned about the lack of research on some of these photographs that were being used as standard illustrations, but not studied as historical documents as sources unto themselves. I knew that the most graphic images were subject to scholarly debates about what should or should not be displayed in the work of, starting with the work of Susan Zontag and then Susan Crane's um, uh, very uh, interesting provocative essay on, on, on not looking at these photographs. But what were the rules about what should be studied and how it should be researched? And what were the ethics and methods of that inquiry? I had written books that privileged the use of Nazi documentation and then another book about a single victim's diary but could visual evidence in a single photograph open up new lines of inquiry and discovery about the Holocaust? Let me stop for a moment and share my screen. You know how this works. And I will, can you see that? Yes, participants can now see my screen. I'm reading here. Here are some of the images I was referring to a moment ago, the railway lines leading to Birkenau. This is the last Jew in Vinitsa. Um, more work has been done on that. But some of these images, including Anne Frank, uh, one of the things that I found um, intriguing, but also in some ways um, concerning, kind of um, disturbing, is the way they've been reproduced for consumption. Um, this one was appearing, uh, uh, anti-Zionist organization was selling t-shirts and coffee mugs with this one. And there's an interesting essay by Tim Cole on the consumption of a consumer uh, um, kind of branding of, of Anne Frank, including um, on um, feminine projects, uh, feminine products, sorry, in, in Japan. Um, but we can talk about that <clears throat> uh, in the Q&A. That's another part of the story. In 2009, this is the image that came to my attention. I was working at the museum in DC, the Holocaust Museum and the archives on another project. And my colleague uh, who works on Ukraine approached me and said, "When you, you know, I think you want to take a look at this photograph. Maybe you can help us find out more about it." And feel free in the chat to respond to your uh, to this image and to some of the questions that you have on, upon looking at it for the first time. The image I learned that day uh, was taken in a town called Mirapol, 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 Ukraine, which is about a hundred miles. 125 miles west of Kiev, kind of central Western Ukraine. Uh, it was taken on October 13th, 1941. That was also known. Um, and the gentleman who brought this to my attention, who came from Prague, uh, there's a reason why it was in the Prague archive, um, is that the photographer himself was Slovakian and the photo had been confiscated by the kind of KGB-like authority um, after the war in, in Czechoslovakia, um, and he was actually questioned about it. So we had his, this photograph, um, and there were a few more. Uh, there were five that we saw in this series. We'll talk about that in a moment. This one was the most um, compelling, the most powerful. It was the, and, um, the, the, the composition of it and the um, individuals who are pictured in it. And I'm gonna walk through some of the pieces of that photograph, the elements that I found particularly um, striking. But from the beginning, basically all I had to start with was the name of the photographer, which was still significant, the date and the location, and that there were more, more photographs to be found. And the first time I saw it, I thought um, that these perpetrators here clustered together um, were, uh, potentially my strongest leads because of the documentation, the Nazi documentation, the German documentation on various units. These men are in uniform. They clearly have markings here that are visible because potential to find what unit this is and then um, uh, place it on the map of Ukraine in October, 1941. But besides that um, potential lead, um, just seeing in this image that these Ukrainians here standing um, with these red army coats and these armbands. These are classic kind of uniforms of the militia who were kind of recruited on the spot in the summer of 41. Um, that this gentleman here is, is in a shooting 
position. He's kind of the man on the right here. He's his facial expression. He's kind of grimacing um, and, um, and and clenching. And this is and and so close to the Germans, kind of shoulder to shoulder. This proximity of the killers to the victims, the fact that they're in this kind of gang formation and it's men and this, this is clearly a woman who's bending over. Um, and the, the, there's almost a pornographic element to this, to this picture here of the men with, with the woman um, uh, in, in, that, in that position. Um, and that they uh, are Ukrainian. I don't know if they're ethnic German, but um, clearly two different um, uh, cultures in this way of Ukrainian speaking, German speaking, the occupier, the local auxiliary, and, and yet they're participating in this, this act together. And I thought in this horrific action scene of murder, that it's possible that there could be some justice that maybe one of these killers in 2009 might, maybe one of them might be still alive, that there could be that uh, possible outcome. But what about the shoes? And now thinking about this picture, not as strictly something as a source of evidence of a crime, of an action shot. And actually there aren't that many pictures of the Holocaust that show the act of killing. Um, as voluminous as this archive is, most of the imagery we have is just before um, with the deportations or a lot of images of, of the victims as, as corpses. Um, but here down below is this image of the shoes, these kind of empty shoes. And having worked at the museum, um, intrigued by this um, symbol, this icon of, of the shoes that we see often on display in museums or along the side of the Danube, um, and how shoes have become this symbol of the absence of presence or the presence of absence and these the individuality of the victims, um, and yet the magnitude of the killing, because often these shoes are not displayed as one pair, but as a pile of shoes. And there they are sitting in the foreground of this image and um, with these documents, or maybe it looks like there might be some fabric there or something, I, th I think it's paper. And if we zoom in, and now that we have the advent of digital technology in our research, we can see in the image um, bullet casings, a kind of litter of mass murder around the shoes. And then here, the fact that it's being, this operation is being conducted in broad daylight, this is an open air mass shooting the so-called Holocaust by bullets. Um, and the fact that in Ukraine, you have one out of every four victims of the Holocaust actually resided in what is what are the borders of Ukraine today. And let's say the borders today, and let's hope that they remain the borders in what's going on currently. Um, so here we have this uh, reality of, of a mass murder operation that's not occurring behind barbed wire, um, not occurring behind the, the, the walls of, of these killing centers, these gassing centers, the, the perpetrators are going to the victims, going to their small towns like the small town of Mirapol. And the environmental history part of this struck me because that's a, another field that has been advancing over the years and um, in, in a very interdisciplinary way and providing new understanding of how we understand um, the human experience vis-a-vis -vis nature or the role of nature and the agency of nature. And the Nazis put nature to work. Um, they used ravines, they used swamps, they used rivers, um, you know, about the history of Babi Yar, as far as that's probably, that's the most famous ravine where Jews were murdered at the end of September 41, about 33,000. They would dynamite the walls to cover up their killing actions. And so this, this notion of an environmental history of the Holocaust, the use of the terrain, the fact that the victims remains remain in these space, spaces, the soil goes through all kinds of putrefaction, decomposition, the um, uh, uh, um, plant life changes over time. Um, and so this is, and this is someone's hometown. This is a, a location, it's part of a park in Ukraine. And, and later on, I would go visit this location, but it becomes part, of, very much a part of that local history in this very um, specific kind of topographical way. And what did that mean as well for the victims um, who in this case were shot, but weren't necessarily dead when they um, uh, landed in this, this grave, this, this was actually dug out. And certainly the children, as we'll see in the photograph, often bullets were not wasted on the children. And so they were thrown into these pits and it was the soil and the weight of their kin and the blood and that suffocation that occurred in that pit. I know it sounds um, incredibly kind of gruesome, but this is part of very much of the, the materiality, the very um, importance of the 
of the use of nature as the Nazis did to carry out their genocidal operations. And here's that cluster of those collaborators, again, shoulder to shoulder, kind of in action. Um, and they're you know, expelling the, the bullets from their guns and they're participating in this kind of anti-Semitic hate, again, crossing these cultures, not speaking the same language. According to the photographer's testimony, the Ukrainian killers um, were locals and they, and they know, and he knew this because they were calling out the names of some of these victims. They, these were their neighbors. And in the center is the family. Um, the woman bending over in her polka dotted dress, those Mary Jane shoes, a little boy there with the bare feet. And if we zoom in a little bit closely here, look closely, we can see the contours, a kind of lines here of another person, another child kind of falling off of the lap of the woman who's, who's bending over. Um, and the smoke, which, you know, in kind of photography studies, they talk about strange 19th century spiritual photography with a kind of halo effect. This is a different kind of um, uh, reality here. This is actually, uh, as far as ballistics, uh, we can see that um, this is a, a mass execution. They're not the first victims. There were several before them because the firing, the muzzle blast here, the smoke is from the prior victims. And when the next group is brought up um, and the um, uh, guns are fired, that um, heat blows a hole basically through the smoke that's kind of been hovering and left from the prior victims. So that's what's going on there according to ballistics. This is the testimony of the photographer, which was presented to me in 2009. Um, and it's rather, it's incredibly significant. It's in Slovakia. And this is a project that required a lot of different resources and a lot of different languages. And I had to rely on colleagues and even Holocaust survivors were helping me translate some of these documents when I was at the museum. Um, so this, this kind of work does um, require obviously all these languages, but you have to, in order to do it, you do have to rely on a lot of your colleagues. It is a, it is an, often a group, effort. So this Slovakian photographer, who's like 25 years old, uh, he was born in 1916. Uh, the picture was taken in 1941. It's the beginning of the killing operations of the Holocaust as we've come to know it during Operation Barbarossa, the attack on the Soviet Union. And here's a, a, a security guard brought in as part of the Axis invasion. So it's Slovakian, Croatian, Romanian, even Italian forces and Spanish forces, um, of course, spearheaded by the Germans who were then um, quickly kind of the military forces were joined by the Himmler's Einsatzgruppe and those mass shooting squads. But as they advanced uh, eastward, uh, these other units came in and kind of got involved in these so-called mopping up operations. Um, and in the case of the photograph that we were just looking at, this Slovakian guard was stationed in Mirapol as was another um, German unit. Uh, those are the Germans in the picture. Um, and they weren't SS and police. I spent years going through SS police records, but in the testimony of the Slovakian, um, he happens to mention a very, very important um, detail. In 1943, Lubomir Skrovina, um, this is Skrovina's testimony, he's the photographer, mentioned to um, his interrogators, he said, I took part in a field campaign on the Eastern Front in Mirapol, Ukraine. I had the opportunity to see the atrocity of the war when Ukrainian militia and German finance guards used guns against partisans. And he says, some of the partisans were shot because they resisted and I took pictures of it. He's not referring specifically to Jews, but he is referring specifically to German finance guards, which um, was clued me into the fact that those Germans were customs officials. Uh, they were there, they're supposed to be in Mirapol checking packages at the local train station. They had no training. They were part of the finance ministry, not part of Himmler's agencies, Had no, were not trained to shoot um, uh, in this way, in these uh, kinds of mass shootings of Jews. It wasn't really there. Um, uh, they weren't following any orders. They were an all volunteer killing squad with uh, those Ukrainians also volunteered. <clears throat> So that one bit of information in this testimony was extremely important to get me on that path. And secondly, down here in the testimony, he's very specific about his camera and the model camera that he has. And it's a Zeiss icon and he provides the dimensions of it. Um, and that was significant because here's the camera and here's our photographer. 
this camera, the kind of film that it could take, and it didn't have a zoom lens, um, could take about eight shots. And we found five. And so ultimately we realized that the five that we had were part of this photographer's attempt to provide a visual testimony sequentially of what happened that day. And this is another photo that he took. This is one of the five. Uh, so this is now you're going to, you've seen two, um, including the one with the family. <clears throat> and again, it's, it's clearly the same um, uh, action, action as the Germans called it, but there's a better frontal view of the German in this, on this angle uh, to identify him and to confirm the, the uniform, in fact, is part of these, this finance ministry. We have the same Ukrainians here. Um, and then here's a woman, and I'm not quite sure what's going on here. I thought this was an armband with potentially a kind of a uh, circle or a Jewish star. Uh, since the book came out, uh, a specialist uh, contacted me from Sweden who does a lot of forensic work with photography. And she thinks that actually that might be a child that she's got a bundle there and that might actually be the blood. Uh, there might, that might be the actual, the head of a, of a, of a child. Um, so I need to do more work, work on that, but you can see the shoes here and you can see these kind of papers and more clearly there's the coat again, and there are the bullet casings and the onlookers. So this story of the Holocaust by bullet and bullets and open air massacres means that we have a lot more witnesses and participants um, within these communities. This is a photographer in September 41. So this is about a month before he took the picture and he took this in a photo studio in this town of Mirapol with his pals and he's right here in the middle. And he was the company scribe and a hobby photographer. And that's why he had his camera and that's why he was able to document what happened on that day. He um, heard the sounds and, and screams um, and his commander said to him, go check it out. And he grabbed his camera and he went with another comrade um, and openly took those pictures because he was in uniform. He was allowed to take those pictures and circulate around that um, killing site. You'll notice that the pictures, um, and I, I got all five of them ultimately, none of them show any Slovakians. And so he was um, in some ways careful not to photograph them, but maybe perhaps um, crop them out of the, cut them out of the negative somehow to not incriminate his colleagues. These, these photographs exist in a time of um, the proliferation is very significant of the handheld camera. And this is gonna be important for the history of photojournalism, obviously, but the history of our understanding of human rights crimes and crime, including crimes of the Holocaust. Of course, the camera was uh, already um, instrumental in the Congo at the late 19th century. Mark Twain famously wrote an essay about the Kodak and how it was the uh, nemesis of King Leopold. Um, but this is increasingly going to be the case in the Second World War, and it was encouraged. Um, this is a uh, an advertisement from a German military magazine um, encouraging ordinary soldiers to bring their cameras. This is called the Optical Panzer. It's a it's a a portable camera, the Voigtlander, that's so durable, it can withstand shrapnel and withstand the um, uh, the uh, violence and the uh, of the warfare and the and the weaponry and so forth. So um, the Nazis were encouraging this. They were very, you know, in the arrogance of of the conqueror wanting to document this for uh, for eternity and for future generations, and also to try to uh, what this advertisement says from Agva. It's a kind of German. Uh, it's a German film company, that the photos are a bridge between the home front and the battlefield um, to bring to unify the community. There's a problem, though, because in the summer of 41, when the Nazis start uh, taking, carrying out these mass shootings in, in broad daylight, the soldiers are taking pictures as well of the mass shootings. And um, immediately Himmler starts to issue orders in the summer of 41, coinciding with the mass shootings, to not take these pictures of these atrocities and then setting up a, 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 his um, subordinates to go through and search, you know, systematically for these pictures and to confiscate them when they come across them, because they knew that they were going to be the source of resistance. Uh, the town of Mirapol, I want to point out, was actually quite significant in Jewish history, and this is part of the story of uh, lost kind of civilizations, especially of, of Jewish life in Ukraine. Um, which was concentrated in what was the Russians called the Pale of Settlement, but actually a town like Mirapol, and this is a map going back to the 17th and 16th centuries, and Mirapol's right here in the center. So it's this little town today. Um, at its peak, it had about 4,000 Jews. When the Nazis arrived, there were 1,200. 
Um, and um, um, you know, all of them, I know of one survivor who was there when the Germans actually arrived. Um, uh, most were uh, evacuated during the Soviet retreat, but about 960, or a good number were evacuated, about 960 were killed. And that photograph that we were looking at was one of those days, one of those massacres in October. Um, it started in July 41, um, then uh, continued in September and then October 41. And then the last of the so-called specialists who had been um, selected out, the, the dentist, for instance, who was uh, a lot of the locals talked about that, the dentist who was selected out. But those specialists um, and their families were killed in January 42 in the ravine of Mirapol. But Mirapol actually had a much longer history at this point of not Russian rule, but Polish rule. It was part of a Polish um, manorial minor system, uh, the Arendia, Arenda system of the marketplace, the Polish manor house, who then granted uh, certain privileges to the Jews in this case to uh, 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 build up the economy. Um, they were located mostly in the center of town and the Polish, or sorry, the Ukrainian peasants were mostly um, uh, working the fields on the outskirts, but there was, there was this kind of interaction um, between the Jews and the Poles and the Ukrainians. It wasn't um, entirely peaceful, but um, certainly nothing like uh, what uh, occurred in the 20th century and what occurred during the, basically, you know, in the first world war, especially and um, in through the Bolshevik revolution and then culminating um, in, in the Holocaust um, during the second world war. And this is what Mirapol looks like today, uh, or this was actually a while ago now, I think I first went there in 2014, and then again in 2016. Um, this is the center of the town. This is what used to be a very vibrant, thriving kind of marketplace. I've seen images from the 19th century um, or bustling, uh, uh, you know, architecture was, this was enclosed. You didn't have these holes here, these gaps. Again, this is part of the, um, impact of the war, the loss of the Jewish community, and then also Sovietization of this town. Um, and then finally, you know, Ukraine struggles uh, more recently in the post-Soviet period of hyperinflation and now an ongoing war with Russia. Um, so these, these chapters of Ukraine's history, but particularly here, this was the center of Jewish life here in this marketplace. Just, this is kind of what you get. You get a gutted civilization um, as we, we look back and at the aftermath of, of genocide. This is their monument to the Second World War here, um, uh, official Soviet monument, and that's a bottle of champagne there that's sitting next to the monument. And the Jews that day, uh, October 13th, were they were gathered the night before on the 12th um, in a pogrom occurred the night before and their houses were ransacked and they were gathered here and, and then marched in the wee hours um, uh, after a, a, a horrible night of assaults and um, uh, uh, all kinds of tortures and, and the local witnesses are explaining, explaining this um, and, and local witnesses who were able to explain this because many of them uh, who were youth uh, during the war um, were in town. They had acquired some of these Jewish houses or they came into town looking for, um, for goods and to, to try to profit from um, the, the so-called removal of the Jews. The Jews were marched down this path, this road here. Um, the center of town is here that I just showed you. And then past this police station, some of them were detained there. We have testimony of Ukrainians who were um, surrounding this police station. They had their rifles and they were dancing. They were singing the totus lead, the kind of funeral march. They were chasing some of the women out um, and assaulting them and then bringing them back. Um, and then from here, um, as they were marched down this path here, I'm following the arrow. This is from the Soviet investigation I'm gonna talk about in a moment, which was late um, 1985, 86, and ended in 87 against those Ukrainian policemen. Um, and so this is a, a really good detailed drawing of what happened. Those Ukrainian policemen were forced to reenact what happened uh, for the Soviet uh, prosecutors. And they were brought to the park, which is, uh, there's my down here where these little trees are drawn here. Um, so this is about a maybe a 10 minute walk over uh, over the over the creek here that goes into the the Sluch River, and this is the actual site. Those here's one of the Ukrainians who was actually arrested. One of the um, actually three of them um, from that from that day uh, 
who were who were pictured in that photograph. Now, the photograph was never part of any trial against the killers uh, because it was sitting in Prague the entire time. The Soviets, uh, Soviet Ukrainians, um, didn't find it, and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how they would have been able to actually with the um, photographer back in Banska Bystrica in Slovakia <clears throat> made made that connection. Um, and the Germans, when they did their uh, very perfunctory investigation of those customs guards um, in 1969, and that didn't go anywhere, um, they didn't have the photograph either. And so it was interesting to have these photographs, have the Slovakian testimony, uh, which really was um, uh, detailed uh, and not, not as much uh, perjuring going on, certainly not as much as the West German accounts, um, to compare the photograph with those accounts and see where the defendants were um, trying to trick the, the questioners, the examiners, and where the defendants were, were lying. Um, because the picture was uh, pretty incontrovertible evidence of, of who was there and the fact that the Ukrainians were shooting alongside the Germans. The Germans said that um, they weren't there, <laughs> certainly not that they were shooting, they just denied being there altogether. So these um, Ukrainians were arrested in the mid-80s, um, an interesting moment as far as perestroika and renewed efforts um, 40 years after the war, and the prosecutor from Jatomer, uh, the neighboring district, came in and uh, did a really a, an impressive job as far as collecting testimony and doing the research um, and getting the facts straight. Um, but uh, part of the investigation entailed actually going to the crime scene and digging it up so that they could um, I have the victim's remains. Um, and um, that uh, was not, uh, while it succeeded in getting these convictions, two of the Ukrainians were um, executed in 87, uh, January 1987, and the third, who was a youth during the war, was given um, 15 years in prison and sent into inner Russia, and I don't know what happened to him, but it's interesting, the case ended in 87, Ukraine got its independence in August 91, um, uh, he may have died in prison, he may have just relocated to another part of Ukraine, I don't know what his, his fate was. And um, the West German approach was, uh, as I said, much more uh, pro forma and uh, it, it's, there's good information here, but it's not very reliable. But the story of how the investigation started was I think interesting. And I reproduced this document in my book. This is just a regular police report that um, any uh, cop on duty would pull out and stick in his typewriter. And I just found it interesting that this one of the former um, uh, members of that finance guard, that customs guard unit, in his retirement, decided he was going to denounce one of his former comrades. It was a personal vendetta, actually. Um, and so uh, here he is coming in um, near Hanover, a small town, just walks in in a uh, January evening and says, I want to report a crime. And this is just this form kind of filled out. The location's misspelled, says, it happened in 1941 during the Nazi period and that the victims were Jewish and Russian people that we don't know. And um, so it's just a regular report. Uh, but that's 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 the German version, the West German version of how this um, was uh, investigated or, or, or to the extent to which it was the Germans were aware of it um, and aware of the uh, crimes of their um, of their uh, of their own um, people. So. What about the family? This was something, um, so I identified the Ukrainian killers. Um, I identified the uh, German killers, although they were let go. Um, but the family at the, the center of the photograph to me became um, an important subject to really think about and kind of problematize more broadly in the history of genocide. And thinking about when we memorialize genocide, we focus on um, individual victims. We name individuals uh, during Yama, Yama Shoah, or we talk about entire communities, whether it's Warsaw uh, or the killing in Babi Yar, 33,000, a half a million, 6 million. Um, and other cases of genocide were pointing me in the direction, especially as I looked at what was going on in the Congo and um, these stories of some of the horrors whereby parents um, and children were forced to suffer with their loved ones and forced to actually um, commit tortures against their family members and the, the, the intense cruelty of that on the part of the genocide heirs and new theories coming out on root and branch genocide and, and how um, gender matters in all of this and why 
procreative force is something that genocide heirs want to um, stamp out. And in the summer of 1941, in fact, um, and this is, by the way, a list of the victims from Mirapol. They're their family surnames here and their birth dates. So these are family units in this list. In the summer of 1941, Hitler had told his Croatian ally, as this campaign of mass shootings is um, uh, uh, about to begin, um, or it is already happening in some places in July 41, he told him that uh, he did not want one family, he used the word family, to survive on the map of Europe um, and explained in his version, Hitler's version of history, that, that even with the expulsions and other episodes of, um, of pogroms and attempts, uh, violent attempts um, against Jews to, to remove them, um, that he said they, they always come back because the family members, the children, um, they want to avenge uh, seek uh, uh, to um, return in, in defiance. And so this, this was, he said, we have to act, actually exterminate them fully, like root and branch and this biological obsession um, and that the family was a part of that. It also got me thinking about the family unit as far as how genocide is experienced by the Jews themselves and the choices that they, horrible choices they had to make as far as you know who's going to immigrate, who gets the rations, um, who should be hidden uh, in Mirapol, the one survivor, Ludmilla Blackman, um, speaks a lot about her family, not just memorializing, but describing these kinds of crisis moments where her father was trying to decide what to do with her older sister. Um, uh, she was uh, um, uh, a target of, of sexual violence. She was a, uh, apparently a, a beautiful young woman. He didn't say he, he told her not to even go register that he wanted her to become kind of a missing person from the beginning to save her. And the fact is that if entire families are wiped out in the way that it occurred in Ukraine, where you have survival rates of in some towns, you know, 2%, less than 2%, um, who's going to come forward to claim someone as missing and the search for the missing um, and the challenges of that when entire family units are are wiped out. And so this is, I think, an important part of the history of genocide. It's not really taken up in Lemkin's work as such. It comes up now and then uh, in the trials um, as an issue uh, on both sides, the, as far as um, Himmler's obsession with uh, genealogy and wiping out families and the Hitler quote I just mentioned to you. Um, but as a uh, category or a unit, uh, a victim unit, there's something to think about. So how do you identify a family in a picture like that where you cannot obviously see their faces? Um, and isn't that part of what we do um, in trying to restore the dignity of those victims who are being photographed at the last moment of their lives in the most um, inhumane way? That is, they don't wanna be photographed at that moment. If they even realize uh, that there's this Slovakian photographer is running around with this camera, um, and if they saw him, they would, would have assumed this person in uniform is just part of the killing forces and is um, someone to be avoided. Um, and the humiliation that they might have, have experienced added humiliation with the, uh, with the camera clicking. So here's a list of the victims from Europol, and it's a, an incomplete list, but that's all I had. So I just worked with that and found that um, there were clusters of, of family units here. And the boy in that picture you know, he's, he seems he's walking. So maybe I could find a family unit with a boy who was born around 35, 38. So he looks like he's four or five. It's hard to date the woman. And I, I did find some family units and I went through them systematically, alphabetically at Yad Vashem through their pages of testimony. That's what this is. Um, and found this um, to my amazement. This is a family that was killed in the Mirapol Park in 1941. Um, uh, this is Hiva Vasalyuk, and um, this is her uh, child and her um, nephew, and these are her um, sisters and sisters-in-laws. And this is this was taken in 1941. This picture, which is also astounding, but this is how they wanted to be remembered. This family, um, in the end, and you can see, you know, the absence of the male heads of household, um, and and it's just a, a, a an incredibly uh, powerful family portrait. Um, and um, uh, really, really gave me pause uh, given the circumstances in which it was taken. And this is um, something that I uh, was really determined to include in the book, but I couldn't 
uh, with certainty um, state that in fact, the woman in the photograph is this woman, and this is the child on her lap, and this is the little boy whose hand she's holding. But I did identify another family in Mirapol. And I took this photograph to the Ukrainian community there who had lived through the war um, and um, started to identify more people in this photograph and collect stories about that family. Going to the crime scene in 2016 with Father Desbois' team, I brought them into this project, uh, Yahad and Unum. Uh, we were really struck as we followed the steps that were on that sketch I showed you that the Soviet prosecutors had drawn. And here we are going to the actual scene and it's in the summertime. Um, and we were just astounded immediately by the landscape and how um, uneven it was and the haloing effect and the mounds and things I had read about um, in various books about forensic archeology span and how um, work at Trebenice and different other crime scenes um, the topography of that, uh, that was very instructive. And in fact, it was what I was seeing um, at this particular site. And we also found bones, which was just shocking because this was, you know, 75 years later, how could it be that I reached down and moved some, some dirt and uh, mud and find vertebrae and skull fragments. And that's because, as I mentioned before, in 1986, um, the Soviets who went in there to find the, to disinter the, the site, to find the, the remains of the victims used trucks and bulldozers, this is the exhumation, um, and that's what disrupted this scene. And it turns out it was yet another assault on these victims as far as um, the mass grave and their, you know, um, disrupting their, their souls, disrupting their peace in this grave, no matter how horrible their death, um, this was yet another assault on that site. And in fact, it had been assaulted before that because of these um, so-called black diggers, the grave diggers who went immediately after the killing, um, digging for valuables and looking for gold in these sites. I just wanna end now with a, a little bit from the epilogue of the book about the shoes, because it was something I also spent a lot of time kind of pondering um, and thinking about in the world of Holocaust studies and memory. And here um, are, are those shoes. And it reminded me of the victims whom we cannot see and the many who were murdered and remain missing and the ambivalence I still felt about not being able to identify that family in the center. Um, and what does that mean in the history of genocide that you just have these entire populations and families that are, are kind of forever missing? Um, prior to and during the Holocaust, empty shoes figured in abstract art, and literature, and photography as symbols of humanity. And the use of shoes, of course, were used to depict loss. It's not only a post-war curatorial technique of Holocaust museums. In fact, shoes already in 1943 were um, the subject of Abraham Sitzkever, a very famous poet from um, Lithuania, wrote a poem called A Load of Shoes upon the discovery of his deported mother's shoes in the Vilna ghetto. And I just wanna read from that kind of in closing um, to think about um, this particular element of the photograph. This is a Sitzkever, just, just two stanzas if you just, um, bear with me for a moment. The feet from these boots with buttons outside or these with no body or these with no bride. Where is the child who fit in these? Is the maiden barefoot who bought these? Slippers and pumps. Look, there are my mother's, her Sabbath pair, in with the others. In Suits Caver's poem, empty boots, slippers and pumps exist somewhere between the living and the dead among the children, maidens and brides at a wedding or observing Sabbath. His shoes dance and patter, and they stimulate our ability to imagine the past and provide poetic testimony to the lives of the wearers, unlike those haunting but inert objects we see today enshrined behind glass in Birkenau or bronzed as a memorial alongside the Danube River in Budapest. Like flawed testimonies and memories, photographs can mislead because they can never completely capture the reality of the event pictured or those involved. The Jewish man who was murdered, perhaps with his family, is not there, although his empty shoes and crumpled coat remain. We cannot see beyond the frame of the image. We cannot turn 360 degrees to take in the entire setting of the victims waiting to be killed or other possible onlookers. Atrocity images, especially the rare ones, that attest to acts of genocide, the crime of all crimes, offend and shame us. When we turn away from them, we promote ignorance. When we display them in museums without captions and download them from the internet with no historical context, we denigrate the victims. 
And when we stop researching them, we cease to care about historical justice, the threat of genocide, and the murdered missing. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you to Professor Lara for a really engaging and thought-provoking presentation. We're now going to open it up to the Q&A. So anyone who's in attendance, I would encourage you to post uh, some questions here and we'll provide them to Professor Lara to answer them and hopefully start a lively discussion. Um, I will wait a minute or two just so we get some questions coming in. I already see a couple here that will be useful. I should say, maybe I'll take this time to remark that I've been a professor lawyer for a long time, and I actually, many, many years ago, we were in, in Ukraine, and I was shown this photograph uh, at the very beginning of this journey, and so I had said, we were chatting before the presentation today, that I had not really got much of an update on, on the status of this photo and this investigation until I got a, a book in the mail about, mm -hmm. uh, about this entire story, so it's been really uh, exciting to see this mm -hmm. journey, uh, investigation, mm -hmm. this really um, important and difficult theme. So. Mm -hmm. One of the themes that I, I didn't really touch on that I just want to throw out there too for um, for the audience is that um, the book deals with this fo fo photograph as um, and, and the pho photographing of a, the atrocity by on the part of the photographer as an act of resistance. So there's, you know, it doesn't look like it. When you look at this photograph, you think whoever took it is collaborating, um, especially if he's in uniform and taking it openly and was, you know, such a, a stable image. Um, and in fact, this was the photographer's turning point and he left his um, duties more or less. He didn't go back, uh, was not, pretended to be ill um, and used these photographs to warn Jews and hid Jews in his attic. Um, so he, he did kind of a complete turn towards the resistance. Um, so it's an interesting, as far as the ethical side of, you know, taking these photographs and what does the, what does the photographer do with that information? Thanks. And so building on that, I'm seeing a couple of questions coming in and I'm doing my best to group these on the flyer. So maybe on that question, there's there was a or that issue, there's a question about the missing three photographs. Did you any speculation as to where those might have ended up? Or, or yeah. What the story yeah. Was? So we got five out of the seven. Well, the photographer spent he was really um, obsessed with finding the rest of them because what happened very quickly, he was arrested three times. Um, in 43, like 57, 58. And um, the pictures and the negatives, everything were, were taken, they were taken from his home. At first he said he burned them in 1943 when he was interrogated. He said, oh, I burned those pictures. Um, Cause word was getting around that he had these, these incriminating photos. And then later on um, the uh, kind of KGB authority after they interrogated him in 58 for being a Slovakian collaborator, cause it was Soviet. Uh, he was in the Soviet zone now, so they were going after him as a fascist, um, the communist. They followed him back. They went back to his house and it was at night and they went in and stormed in and just took all of his stuff. Um, so until he died in 2005, he was writing, um, requesting, like, where are these negatives? Where are the rest of my photographs? Um, and I looked for them as well. And I, you know, spent a lot of time in Prague. And I also involved the Holocaust Museum in this, the search for these, the rest of the negatives. And they, they're not turning up. I mean, this is the thing. I mean, you, you just, things get lost and misplaced and, and destroyed. Um, so I don't know. I'm hope, I hope they will turn up. It's, it's a mystery uh, as, as hard as we tried. And Scroven uh, donated, we have his camera because when he died, he, he donated his camera to the Museum of the History of Jews in Bratislava. And he put in his donation letter um, now this is like around, you know, this is post-Soviet. He said, this photograph shows the Ukrainians killing and I'm seeing a lot of whitewashing going on right now. And this is being suppressed. So I, you know, the Demyanyuk case was happening. And so yeah. like, I want this to be known, um, that they were actually shooting too. So that was one of his missions. And he again, asked them to find the negatives, which haven't turned out. Fascinating. Yeah, and maybe it was interesting you made that comment about people who've re reached out now that the book is out there and the story is out there that perhaps this will be kind of an interesting push to get more information and could make for a, an interesting future epilogue or introduction to the second or third edition of this book. Oh, podcast. sure. I hope those turn up. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody Michael had a question. Rothberg had a question about, sure. I guess your students were discussing a Sutzkever poem recently last yes. week. Mm -hmm. 
I've just, I'm really, I got a new book. It was, uh, I think it was one of the uh, National Jewish Book Award winners. Um, someone just recently from Smith College translated uh, finally in English, Suits Caver's memoirs um, and his kind of diary uh, from the Vilna Ghetto and his, his um, and from when he gave testimony at Nuremberg. He was the first Jewish person to come into the world stage in the context of Nuremberg and, and kind of speak on behalf of the Jewish uh, Jewish victims, pretty, pretty intense moment um, uh, after the war. Um, so Michael had a question about the response of the residents in Mirapol when, we, when I visited and any more about why the finance guards were there and how unusual that, or how usual that was. Or there, I think there's at least one other case um, and I would bet there's probably more. Uh, I found Chris Browning, um, I was talking to him about this and he's like, oh, Mark, I think it was Markovich. He wrote a, a essay in the Yavashem studies about some finance guards who um, did the same thing, kind of were like recruited on the spot or volunteered on the spot. Um, and we know that too, um, some of the guards, the um, border guards units, the Grenz, like Schutzpolizei. Um, so as far as you know, German perpetrators, um, it, it's, it's possible that basically anyone, even not in uniform, <laughs> was somehow in these open air shootings, they had the kind of opportunity, the moment where they could actually come in. Um, in fact, the SS had come in the night before this shooting. These guys were playing Scott, this German card game. And they were like hanging out in the canteen that Sunday afternoon, uh, off duty, obviously. And they, and the SS came in and said, why are there Jews in this town? I thought we got rid of them all. Uh, who wants to get rid of them tomorrow? And these guys stood up, said, yeah, well, yeah, well, we are going to do this. So that, that whole scene, the way that was described to me, seems like, um, uh, that happened more than once. Um, as for the Ukrainians, uh, really mixed. Um, the, the thing that's so interesting about going back to a place, a small town uh, setting like that, is that it is a bit of a time warp. Uh, the people you're speaking to, they're not reading this history. They have really no formal education about this history. And they give you their snippets. Um, they're very specific. Like I saw green uniforms, I saw gray uniforms. They came in, came in on bicycles. They stood over there. The, 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 the mass murder pit was about the size of my barn. Um, uh, I, I saw that person, but not that person. I mean, if they, if they have a memory. Um, and in the same way, they're also very candid about um, when we spoke to who went in during the pogrom. And she said, I wanted to go into the Jewish, there was a market and I knew that um, I could go in there and people were ransacking the shelves. And she's like, I went in, you know, this was my opportunity. I wanted, I wanted to get a tube of toothpaste. I was, you know, I really wanted that. <laughs> so yeah, there's a kind of candor um, uh, that is really um, in some ways like refreshing, but inc obviously incredibly helpful. They don't tell you stories. They just give you these pieces, right? I'm sure, and I'm sure you probably had the same. They might have a story about something like they talked about the dentist because they had gone to the dentist. So there was like this Jewish figure who kind of intersected the communities. Um, or um, they talked about um, that family photograph I told you, Hiva, the woman and the two children, she had a grandmother who's not pictured in that photograph and um, they killed her in her bed. She was infirm. And the community had this like collective memory and in the next generation, took on this memory too, because younger people were telling me about it, people who were not around during the war, of this woman in this bed being carried out, wrapped in bed sheets and carried, brought to the, um, to the massacre site. That just is like one of these images that stuck in the local memory. Great, I'll, I'll follow up with uh, another question here. So um, this is from one of our other teaching team members. This is, um, this is Professor Broskos says, thanks for a terrific forensic reading of this photograph and for your reflections on intolerable images in general. The importance of the photographer seems like a very interesting vector for interpretation. In particular, I'm thinking about the idea of this photographer cropped out, uh, mm -hmm. how this photographer cropped out certain elements an act which may or may not have been intentional. And I'm wondering if you or other readers of these types of photographs have speculated on this intentionality of framing uh, mm -hmm. or of the subconscious mm -hmm. nature of certain aesthetic or practical choices made by the photographer in this situation. Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question. And I, this is something that I kind of ran with as well in this project unexpectedly. Uh, fascinating to look at the biography of the photographer and think about that he is 
creating his document, his testimony of what happened using the tools in this case of visual of, of the photograph, right? And then I could actually, I could combine it with letters because he um, wrote to his wife and she joined him in the resistance. They were, they were partners in that way. And she was providing the film and all of that. So the family shared the letters with me so I could get a bigger, a better sense of who he was and his like character. And I interviewed them and they gave me more things, including drawings from his childhood and his kind of personal papers. Cause I wanted to understand like, what was his moral frame and, you know, his motivation for taking this and, and what was this person like? Um, there's a famous uh, James Curtis who's a specialist of early American photography. Um, just wanna quote quickly from him. He says, if we are to determine the meaning of a documentary photograph, we must begin by establishing the historical context for both the image and its creator. A documentary photographer is an historical actor bent upon communicating a message to an audience. Documentary photographs are more than expressions of artistic skill. They are conscious acts of persuasion. The work of the most accomplished photographers reveals a fervent desire to let images tell a story. Uh, they're communicating their views. They're not passive observers. They're active agents searching for the most effective way. Um, so, you know, then that's important. That's why thinking about all these images that are out there and that we don't know about the photographer and the context in which it's taken, if it's an official photograph or if they have control over that and the creation of it and the cropping of it and, and the life of that photograph, that the image itself puts things in motion. It's like created by someone and then it becomes the, you know, the beginnings of justice as far as identifying people it becomes beginnings of a project like this book that I just finished, which has a kind of research memorial aspect to it. Um, so yeah, I just, I find it fascinating how <clears throat> this medium opens up all these possibilities. There's a great, uh, really great work on this now on humanitarian photography, a book, uh, Fehrenbach and um, Jennifer Evans has done work and Ulrich Baer and, uh, you know, they're in, they're in the ravine, they're cited in the ravine, but I, I love that, that vein of scholarship and the late David Schneer's work, which is so great. Uh, I wanted to mention him as well. Yeah, that's another wonderful book that could certainly be read uh, alongside yours, and, and the timing is really quite, really quite amazing. Um, I, I guess there was, a, I mean, maybe similar on this on this photograph question. It, have you seen, and maybe in, in a lot of these the German cases, which you're really just one of the world's experts on these cases, did you would you see photographs used in any of the other Ludwigsburg's investigations of, of German perpetrators? Oh, sure. I mean, um, there's a great, there, there, there are a lot of Ludwigsburg cases. So this archive uh, in Germany, um, which came out of a West German organization that was charged with the investigation of Nazi crimes starting in about 1958, I think. Um, and so this was a very active organization as far as investigations, not so <laughs> um, successful as far as convictions, but the archive itself is voluminous and phenomenal. And they have a... Um, uh, an entire section of that archive that is just the uh, the bills, what they call the Bildnachweis, so the imagery evidence, the image evidence. And I've gone through that, just, you know, like what is in that archive and what did they collect? And, and by the way, it's fascinating to go to the Simon Wiesenthal archive in Vienna and go through his um, photo collection, because not only was he getting these kinds of random photos from survivors, like, you know, that this, you know, here, you know, do something with this, start an investigation. People were mailing things to him. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty interesting um, collection of, of, of photos and also photo albums, which are really important. Um, that's another level of a kind of creative <laughs> endeavor on the part of the, um, of, the, of, of the person, the author of that, um, whether it's official or, or personal. Um, so yes, there's, there's quite a bit. There's a, a, a book that Andre Umansky recently published uh, based on a set of photographs from Ludwigsburg um, from um, Ukraine. Again, I'm interested in Ukraine. In this case, it's Rovno. Uh, one of the most amazing series. And unfortunately, you have, I don't have good quality reproductions of that. Um, it was a November 41, about 15,000 Jews were killed. Um, the, you know, <laughs> the German official who talked about that after the war said that was a small nest. Um, anyway, so uh, there was a, a, a Wehrmacht soldier who, who kind of followed that and was taking pictures that are some of the ones that we know of the, folk, the victims walking, but he went to the killing fields and he was taking all these pictures of the landscape and 
And so it's an interesting series of this violence, but in this scene, this natural scene, pastoral scene. And then at the end of the series, unbelievable, he takes his picture and he goes to the camera and he goes down and it's a um, identity, a Soviet identity book opened up face open uh, with a Jewish woman's picture, her face, you know, and then the, her identification information kind of looking up and he's going down and it's sitting in the grass and um, you can make out her name. And I, I, uh, I would love for someone <laughs> to, to work on that, like that series. And then to, you've got the name of the victim right there, you know, and it's her actual Soviet identification. And, you know, it's just like, wow, that would be an interesting project. Amazing. I will, I will let some colleagues. In the Ludwigsburg archive. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll let some colleagues know about that. A um, question from a student. This is a, a big question, so this is a, a, a great question. Um, who says, given that we may see a future without Holocaust survivors in the next few decades, mm -hmm. do you think that the lack of living testimony uh, will impact the role of photographic evidence in Holocaust memory? Uh, if so, how? Yeah. Um, yes, I, I do think so. Um, I think because we do tend to, as much as we live in this world of, you know, doctored photography and airbrushing, the Soviets were masters of that, that these, I mean, these things can be manipulated. They are, as I mentioned, the creators, you know, are trying to convey something interpretively um, with the photograph, but they do capture a reality. I mean, and it's frozen in time and it's, there are things there that I found things in this photograph that Lubomir Skrovina didn't, right? That he did, he took it and, and studied it in a different way. And, um, you know, didn't know the names of the German killers, right? It was, that's just part of the whole corroboration with other evidence. So these photos do have that staying power. I think visual evidence is also so powerful as far as our imagination. Um, the stories, you know, combining them with the stories, all the more powerful. It doesn't mean that the witness testimony is, you know, we've got 50,000 at the USC and, and, and several thousand at the Yale program and such. Um, none of these things can really stand alone. Um, uh, I mean, they do, they exist, they can exist alone, but they don't, this photo alone is not a story, right? So you, you have to piece these things together in order to draw meaning from them and, 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 and tell those stories and, and reconstruct that, that history. So, um, for me, it's, it's not an either or, I mean, it's, it's, it's the richness of everything and the way that we combine it, but we have to understand that these are different types of sources that have to be handled in different ways and analyze in different ways as well. So that's kind of the, the, uh, the academic challenge. Hey, I'm gonna perhaps use my authority position as the, uh, the discussant here to ask when we question on my own accord as we sort of wrap up and we've already used a lot of your time. Um, so I, I just wanted to, I'll just frame this first. So there's something fitting about the way uh, you've structured this story um, and with all these different threads across uh, uh, time and space. And also in a sense that you're almost unable to pull all of them together in the way that you'd like. Um, that there's sort of this underlying mystery in terms of the victims and some of these other loose ends that are left there. Um, it actually reminded me of another recent book, which I also think should could be read alongside yours by uh, Philippe Sands uh, called mm -hmm. The Rat Lines, um, mm -hmm. which is also sort of replete with this wonderful, dazzling research and field work, uh, travels around the globe. It's very layered. It pulls together uh, the past and the present in an exciting way. Uh, and similarly, his story is also sort of undergirded by an underlying mystery in the present of trying to solve, um, just trying to sort of solve a, this one, I'll give it sort of a, a murder mystery. Um, and it also sort of ends by, being, by saying, you know, a lot of these questions are unable to um, unable to be answered. Uh, but of course, by the time you finish it, similar to your book, it's sort of the, the journey itself, of course, was the, was the prize uh, all along and not necessarily asking all the questions and answering all the questions. And I see that with this work that there's, um, that perhaps this is the way this was approached in terms of its form of working from a piece of evidence outward mm. versus as historians tend to do, choosing a general theme or a time mm. period mm. Or, or, or something larger. And so I'm just wondering about the kind of stylistic approach and, and this project is it's maybe somewhat of a little bit of a departure uh, for you in terms of how it's set up and maybe just some thoughts about this, this kind of process of this way of doing history. And do you see future projects going in this direction for mm. yourself? Um, so yeah, very broad question. Oh, I'd like, that's a great question. And one of my goals going into this, um, one of like my motivations for doing it, what I hoped to accomplish was to 
kind of show off the different ways that we can approach this history and all the tools we have, uh, just all the possibilities because Holocaust studies over the decades has made big strides and we've had a lot of infrastructure, a lot of institutional support for this. Um, and people in the field kind of know it and people in the field know that we get around the table and roll up our sleeves and do this kind of work and get to go into museums and use the technology there as like infrared analysis of, of handwriting and, you know, it just, it's, it's, or going to the crime scenes themselves. So I kind of, I wanted to um, share that with a broader audience that this is what's going on and it's, um, and that's exciting and maybe encourage more research as a result, but also with students I use in the classroom, like, hey, you know, this is, this is what you could do with a single source. Um, but it doesn't, you know, this is also a moment I think in history writing where we have a lot more creative uh, latitude and a lot of possibilities in the way that we construct and tell stories. And is it strictly chronological in our narration? Is it biographical? Is it thematic? You know, this, in this case, I took the image and um, puzzle pieced it as far as pulling out the elements as I did in the beginning of the presentation. And those kind of roughly constitute the chapters, but history writing is also thematic chapters, right? But, um, you know, so we just, it's, I think it's, it's exciting to be an historian because you not only have the possibilities, all these interdisciplinary kinds of approaches and tools and the environment and, you know, and theory and empirical and the aesthetic and the evidentiary and, you know, and the literary, the poetry. So, you know, of course, um, I'll be the first to admit that I have to rely on colleagues to help me make sense of it. We can't be you know, experts in every, in every way, but, um, but that doesn't, you shouldn't shy away from that because if you're trying to get at a basic, um, what happened, it involves kind of all this, these dimensions of, of like the human experience and also to be open-ended about it, that it's a discovery process and you're learning too. And if you're, and you're open like that, you know, sometimes students start their papers with their thesis, like, okay, I'm going to just, this is what I want to argue or I'm, I'm sure this is, this is, you know, what the theme is or the argument is, you know, you could have started my book with, um, you know, I'm sure um, that um, family should be a category of genocide. And this was a major omission of Lemkins and we need to get this on the table. Um, but in the end, no, you know, family that would, it's hard to argue family as a, as a victim unit. We could talk about that too, but I didn't, I didn't go into it with that. Like, this is my thesis and I'm going to, this is going to be my intervention. Um, it was more about, um, you know, reflecting on these things uh, more and thinking about them more and exploring them more. It's more of an exploration and a discovery and a display of um, the kinds of things we can do as researchers and, and scholars of the Holocaust. That's great. No, it's a it's a kind of look behind the curtain, and it's a really excited one, exciting one, and it's and it's such it's so refreshing to see uh, so much you know creativity, especially in this in this particular uh, field and study of the Holocaust. So. And not too much creative license, because you know this is <laughs> this is the thing. I mean, with this subject matter, you know, everything has to be buttoned up of course, of course. and certain. And I, most people don't like to read footnotes, but I think half the book is footnotes. And I try to distill, I try to kind of, you know, bring things down to kind of their essence in some ways and, but back it up, show that this is undergirded by, you know, a lot of archival material, but not subject the reader to that, to that slog. Wonderful. Well, on behalf of our, our cluster course and on behalf of oh. the Lady Center, we really want to thank you for uh, for joining us today and, and wish you all the best of luck and hope to have you back in the future and hopefully visit us on campus and sometime soon as well. I hope so. I really wanted to come today. I was I had that on my calendar, but yes, we will reunite. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jared. And, and you students are very, very lucky to be in the classroom with Jared and Professor McBride and Professor Rothberg. <laughs> You're in very good hands. So thank you. Bye.